Well, good morning once again, everybody. It is so good to see everybody and everyone else online. Can we go ahead? Can we just do that again? Can we welcome everyone online as well? Come on, you can do better than that. Come right here. You know, I just think it's important to celebrate and exercise our joy muscles. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. And so what happens is this. The joy of my salvation, when you realize that this is as worse as it gets, it only gets better, I think that's worth a lot of joy. So it's not just emotionalism. What it is, it's aligning our joy with the reality of heaven. So what I want you to do is I want you, one more time, everybody, can we thank God for what he's done for us, that we have a hope and we have a future? Come on. Let me hear it this morning. Come on. Yeah. Amen. I'm telling you how important it is. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Let them know that the Lord is near. And so I want to encourage you with that because you know what happens? Sometimes you don't want to be joyful. Sometimes things are difficult. But for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. And this is just to remind you that Christmas is coming. There's a little gift there. You can see that? Uh, Christmas is on its way. If you're wondering what that little box is for, we're just giving you a little heads up that Christmas is on its way. I know everyone's wondering what's going on. We'll have a fix next week, praise the Lord. Okay, we're in the middle of a series called The Way, The Truth, and The Life. And by the way, my name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. Thank you so much for joining us today. If this is your first time or haven't been here in a long time, or if you're watching online, if we want to let you know something, everybody, and everyone for that matter, that God loves you so, so much. He really, really, really does. God, it, it, this is the truth. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. That's how much he loves you. In fact, the Bible says that God came to this planet through Jesus Christ to save us. And the objective of Cornerstone, I want to just remind everyone why we're here. We're here because we want to help people come to know God. I mean, we're just like in a national park. We're just park rangers. We want to show you the majestic, the majesty of God and who he is. That's what it's all about, to know God. Not just to know about him, but to know God. God wants to know you. And you're designed by God for God. And everyone knows inside their hearts that, man, there's got to be more than this. Yes, yeah, right, because you're made by God for God. And our objective is to help you come to know God. And you know what happens when you know God? You begin to find freedom. Because we've been trying to find freedom our own ways. We try to do it our own ways. We try to spend money our own ways. Do relationships our own ways, right? And we try all these things to find peace our own ways. And looking at all the wrong things. But God has come to give us freedom. So when you know God, you begin to find freedom, and that happens through relationships. And I want to encourage you. The Bible says pray for one another that you may be healed, and I want to encourage you to get involved, get connected. Don't do it alone. As you walk out of here today or after the service, you can go online. This is how we find freedom, through Jesus Christ and his body. You know what happens then? Then you begin to discover the reason why you're alive. You're not alive just to be a consumer index. You are alive for a particular purpose that God has good things for you. And then what happens is we begin to make a difference together. This is why we exist as a church. And I want to encourage you to be a part of it today. We have growth track, I think it's step two today. So we encourage you to come at one o'clock, either on Zoom or in person. We're in the middle of a series called The Way, The Truth, and The Life, and we finished out that verse. I really want to encourage you, uh, if you don't memorize scripture, please memorize this verse, John 14, 6. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So today we're going to talk about this. How then shall we vote? Oh no, he's going to get political. No, I'm not. Is God a Democrat or Republican? Are you ready for that? Okay, we're going to talk about these a little bit today, but I, I tell you right now, this is not a partisan message. This is about Jesus Christ and him crucified. But I wanted just to help you understand that John 14, 6 is just not a verse you just throw out. It literally is the way to our life. Because Jesus tells us, and Thomas did not know what to do, what is going to happen in his life. We don't know what's going to happen in our country. We don't know, as we see Europe now, they're having a resurgence of this thing. What's going to happen is going to happen here. What's going to happen in the new year? I don't know. But guess what? I know the person who knows it all, and that's God. And it's no, it's not your brother or your sister. It's Jesus knows it all. Okay? No, we don't know, Lord, where you're going. Thomas said, we have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And we always want to know, God, what should I do? Should I go here? Should I do that? There's a lot of questions. 
And Jesus says this to him, and he says it to us. John 14, 6, memorize this, please. This is one of these anchor verses. Jesus told him, I am. Remember, we talked about that. I am says, the word I am means I'm God. He says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. He doesn't say he shows the way. He says, I am the way. He doesn't say, I'll show you truth. He says, I am the truth, and I am the life. And so a lot of us try to go after all these things, and they're fine, but why go after the wake of what is truly the wake maker, which is Jesus? He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And we want to go after him, not just the things of him, because if you go after the things of him, you'll be disappointed, because the things of him are not him. They're only the things of him. We have to go after Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me, yes, exclusive. And I just want to remind you, the reason why I do a review, because you'll forget everything I said. I don't even remember what I preached six weeks ago. All right, this is why we do this. Part one, we talked about this. Jesus is the way. We mentioned the fact that direction, not intention, determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines direct, uh, destination. And a lot of people are saying all sorts of things. I believe this, I believe that. Even right now during this political season, look where their feet go, not where their mouth goes. Okay? And you have the greatest intentions of the world. But if you don't have the right direction, it isn't going to work. And we talked about that. And we second week, we talked about what is truth. Is truth absolute? Yes, it is, because it's Jesus Christ. We mentioned that truth is this. Facts, information, Plus the love of Jesus in a relationship equals truth. That's truth. Facts and information don't save you. In fact, the, the enemy, it uses it. He calls, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, the enemy's called the accuser of the brethren. He takes God's words and he slices and he dices using truth, using facts and information that is accurate, but it's not truth. It's only truth is only found through the love of Jesus equals truth. I'm telling you right now, truth is absolute and unchanging. It's not relative if it's true truth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The word of God, the Bible, is our standard bearer for us. So in the part three, we said that Jesus is the life. He gives us life. And we mentioned the fact that living in Jesus' life is a choice. We mentioned at every moment we choose to live in life or death Choose life. And then last week, we mentioned this. We mentioned the last part of that verse. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this will get you stoned. This will get you in prison. This will get you locked up. I mean stone. I mean thrown with rocks. Okay. We make that very clear. <laughs> we don't advocate that here. Okay. Uh, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Natural revelation. He shows himself. My wife Sandra was driving here this morning, and she says, "I she's on the highway sipping her Starbucks coffee. Uh, she saw the sunrise, and she, uh, if you don't mind me saying this, but she said she got tears in her eyes. I said, how can people say there's no God? Every person's made in the image of God. They know that there's a God. Everyone knows, but you can repress it. Natural revelation. Everyone has received the knowledge of God. Jesus is the only way. God will reveal himself to those who really want to know him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Go back to cornerstonecheshire.com, and you can listen to these sermons and go into greater detail. Why is Jesus the only way? In fact, we even began, praise God, we had now podcasts. You can go to Spotify or Apple iTunes and put Cornerstone Church Cheshire and sign up, and we'll drop it in your box so you can, why, in your commute from your workplace to wherever you're going or from the bedroom to the kitchen, your commute, some of you work at home, you can listen to the podcast, okay? So today I want to talk about this. We're going to unpack this a little bit. It's one thing to quote a verse. What does it mean? I don't just want theory. I want to be practical, right? So the way, truth, life test. There's a way, truth, life test. This is a good thing to ask yourself. If you want to know what you're supposed to do, what am I supposed to do with my job? What am I supposed to do in this relationship? Should I move in with her even though we're not married? Should I do this or do the other? What should I do, God? Should I forgive my brother? I don't know if I should ever talk to him again. Okay, here we go. We're ready? Here's a test. Jesus, what is Jesus' way? Uh, Jesus said, I forgive, my, I forgive those that hurt me. Okay, there's your answer, right? Jesus, what is the way? Is this, is this the Jesus way? Ask yourself the question. Is this Jesus' truth or is this a lie? Do I have to 
falsif- can I falsify? The government has enough of my money. I'm going to falsify this a little bit. I'm going to cook the books. Not just cook the books. I'm going to saute the books for a little bit of a, not report this, right? What is Jesus' truth? Is this Jesus' truth? Or maybe you feel like, oh, I'm no good. I'm not good at anything. God must hate me. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? He loves you. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just. You remember these things, right? And then you say, does this lead to the life of Jesus? Is this conversation? Is this movie? Is this music? Is this leading to Jesus Christ's life? Is my conversation in life? Or is it bringing in death? How, this is pretty awesome to have this test. And finally, the really what it asks us to do is this. The most important thing is, how does this lead us to the Father? Does this bring me to Jesus? Does this bring me to God Almighty, God the Father? If it doesn't, Maybe it's not the, may not be sin, but it may not be the best thing. So this is the, the way, truth, and life test. But today, we're going to talk about this. How should I vote? We're going to tell you what to vote. We're going to lock the doors. We're going to hand out ballots. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And we're going to force you to, no, we're not going to do that. How should we vote? Is God a Democrat or a Republican? How many of you are like, oh, great. I, I, I came to church to have relief from politics, and he brings up politics. Why does he have to do that? It's like going to a sports game. Now they're doing it at church too. No, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ and how he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And I want to bring up today a little bit about this, a story about Joshua and, and these principles of Joshua fit into today. What's going on today, everybody, we need to be people that are about God's truth. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life in every aspect of life. He has to reign supreme. And so I want to share with you a story today. We're going to talk about what it means about voting, but we're not going to talk about particular candidates in regards to who you should vote for, but we're going to talk about how you should vote in part. So this is a story about Joshua. You might have heard of him. Joshua was Moses' successor. Moses was a deliverer God utilized to set free those in captivity, the Hebrew people. Moses was born in, this, in slavery, but his mother thought he was special, hid him in a basket in the Nile River. Um, Pharaoh, who was the president, if you will, of Egypt's daughter, saw the baby, heard the baby, had compassion, and raised Moses as her own child. He was the prince, quote unquote, of Egypt. He grew up that way, but at the age of 40, he saw the problems in the society. He saw how they were treated poorly, and he wanted to deliver his people, so he tried in his own way. Right desire, wrong methodology. The methodology was his own way, and his own way was to kill an Egyptian man, and that kept him on the run. He became a fugitive, and basically uh, his destiny was thwarted because he did it the wrong way. He ended up being in the wilderness for 40 years. Then God calls him when he's humbled. And God sends him back to Egypt, brings the Israelites out through miraculous signs and wonders. Brings them to the wilderness where God is, has met their needs. And now they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And then comes his successor, Joshua, which means Jesus. Joshua, the successor. Moses says, fear not. Be of great good courage. Go take the land I have for you. God tells him the same thing. Moses, your, my, Moses, my servant has died, God says. Now you go and do it. Who, me? Yeah, you, go. And God would say to us today, we are should take our inheritance what is ours. And the promises of God are yes and amen. Let God be true and every man be a liar, the word of God says. So what happens is Joshua does a, uh, God uses a miracle. They cross the Jordan River. They get to the other side. All of a sudden, what happens? The 40 years of provision. God gave them 40 years of manna. Every day they had enough food to eat and never got sick. The manna stopped. The way they used to live life stopped. Have you noticed that 2020, things have gotten a little bit different. The way life used to go has changed significantly, hasn't it? We have to rely on God on a new level. We can't rely on the systems that we used to rely upon. We have to rely upon God. And this is what Joshua was facing. And so he faces this, and he, he sees a great obstacle in front of us. A lot of us see a great obstacle in front of us. How are we going to go? The, what's 2021 going to be like? We're not even done with 2020 yet. What's going to happen, God? What's going to happen? I see these great walls ahead of me. God's saying, I'm with you. Go, take it. Wherever you place your foot, I've given you. So Joshua starts marching up and going by himself to, to look at the land. He's spending time with God alone. 
And here we come to this passage. I wanted to bring you context because not everyone always understands the history of the Bible. And that's okay. We want to help people understand. So now Joshua, the great conqueror who has not conquered anything yet, when Joshua was by Jericho, Jericho was their first city they were going to conquer, a tremendous city, walls that were so large that a chariot could ride on top of it. So when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. Is this, this, this is this big warrior guy. I mean, whoa, who's this guy? I mean, he had a huge sword, a warrior, and, and he's like, well, this guy's a serious soldier. He probably, I don't know if he knew it was an angel or not, but it was an angel. He was overwhelmed by the guy's presence. And Joshua went to him and said to him, hey, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? He finally got the picture. It was an angel. Are you for us or our adversaries? And by the way, if you're for us, we're the people of the book. We, we, we got the Ten Commandments. We got the 611 laws that support the Ten Commandments. We're God's people. We're, we're serving him. This land is our land. This land is your land. Right? This is our land. And so he said, this is it. We're godly. And those Jerichoites, those Jerichrats, or those Jerichons, they're no good, man. They're killing their children, that they, which they were doing. They were worshiping false gods. They're living in moral lifestyles. They're, they're, they're wicked. So obviously, you're for us. So we asked the question, are you for us or for you are for our adversaries? And we would say that today. Well, the Republicans are for God and the Democrats are the adversary. Are we so the Democrats are for God and the Republicans are the devil, right? Which one are you? God, which one are you for? Are you for us or for you? Are you for our adversaries? And here he said, and he said, what? No. But I am commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Is God a Democrat? Is that a Republican? No. He is the kingdom of God. And my friends, it's time for us to understand that I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm a child of God. And I go to a higher standard. I see people sharing more about a political party than Jesus. Do we have, do we have like signs in our yard saying Jesus loves you or do we have a candidate there? And I'm, I'm okay with, with saying you like a candidate, but people are on and they're being apologetic to the different people on Facebook and there's, there's all sorts of social. And listen, I'm okay for sharing that, but people are passionate, talking about passion about their candidate. But gee, he, no, I'm not for your adversary. Even though your adversary is a mess, I'm with the kingdom of God. We need to get to that place that it's about the kingdom of God. Look what he says next. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worship. What we need to do right now during this time is fall to our face, which is take a knee and fall to our face and say there's only one king, King Jesus. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words are forever, right? He fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Are we willing to ask the Lord, God, what are you saying to us? Not what these other people are saying. What are you saying, God? And the commanders of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet. This was a holy moment. He was meeting with God. In many ways, sandals represent a way to walk. You can't, you can't do this your own way. Take off your shoes. You're not going to be able to walk this out in your own schematics, in your own structure. There's a different way to walk. Take off your shoes, for you are standing on holy ground. There's a way that seems right to a man and ends in destruction. It's God's ways. He knows the beginning from the end. He is the alpha. He is the omega. Take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. Do you realize if you've given your life to Jesus, you're holy. It's holy ground. 
We should not allow the junk to get on the holy ground. And Joshua did so. Are we willing to do so? Dr. Tony Evans, one of my favorite pastors in Texas, Dallas, Texas, gave a tremendous illustration, which I'm going to bring to you today. It just really does a great job of describing what we just read. And he talks about this. He talks about football. How many like football? Yeah, okay, football. All right. So, I, I mean, how many like the uh, uh, New England Patriots? Okay. How about those New York Yankees? Okay, maybe next year. But that's baseball. This is football. Okay, you got the New England Patriots. Imagine New England Patriots are playing the New York Giants. They're playing each other, okay? And, uh, you know, God bless them, all right? They're, they're sitting there. And what their objective is to beat each other, right? That's the objective. And so what happens is, in a football game, you have a field, 100 yards, you have goalposts, and then you have something called rules. You ever hear of rules? There are rules of what you can do, what you can do. That's a foul. You know, they have all these rules, and they have a book, that has all the rules of how to play football. And there are these people on the field that are not wearing jerseys from um, the Giants or the New England Patriots, but they have these striped things on, right? They look like they're in prison. <laughs> and they walk around all cool, holding here. You know, they talk about that and they have a microphone. And, and what they do, basically, is they bring order to the disorder. They're not they're not wearing a jersey of any team. They're of a different team, and they have a book. And that book tells them what's right and what's wrong and how they're going to enact the game. In fact, the headquarters is in New York City of the NFL. And so they take this book, and they'll call a foul or what have you. Now, that's what happens. Now, what would happen, and, and by the way, if, if they don't know what happens, if a play takes place and it's under review, let's take a look at it. They get together. All the, all the refs get together and they look at it. They put the headphones on and they look at the instant replay and they look at the rules. What do the rules say? How does this apply to this? And then they make a verdict. And without that, there's chaos in the field. Well, in many ways, everybody, the church is like the referees. What would happen if the referee in the middle of the game took off his referee jersey and God forbid put on a new uh, Patriots jersey? Now, if you put on a Giants one, that might be all acceptable. But imagine putting on a, 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 the opposing team's or any team's jersey. That's not the job of the referee. Because why? Their ways are higher than the players. They have the structure in which the game is based, and they are telling us how to run it, how to do it right. They're instructing the game. But if they put a jersey on, they delegitimize themselves. You know, the church has done the same thing. I have a Republican jersey on. I have a Democratic jersey. No, we are called to a higher calling than that. We got to speak to this situation. We, in, we instruct, we inform, but we are not to be them. It's okay if you understand if you are a Democrat or Republican, but we have to step out of it. The problem is if you try, to, you try to convince someone, I know people that are apologizing and trying to bring people to their party. There's a different way to do it, everybody. And so what I'm concerned about is I see what's happening is we are more identified with a political party than the kingdom of heaven. It's a mistake. We lose our credibility. It doesn't make a difference what side of the party you stand. If you're independent, if you are a Republican, a Democrat, whatever you are. The question is, we don't have the luxury to put on a jersey. We're of a different team. We're of a different kingdom. And that's what it's all about. You see, this is the truth. God is over all the nations of the earth. Do you realize that? In fact, the Bible said, for kings, kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. He, and this is what it says in Daniel. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings, which would be like presidents, and sets them up. Kings, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And Romans 13, 1, this is what it says. Listen to this. Let every person be subject, submissive, to the governing authorities. Now, when Apostle Paul wrote this, guess what? The Romans were in charge. Were the Romans godly? Hardly at all. They were into pagan worship. 
Well, I'm proud to be a Roman, or at least I know. No, I mean, they were Romans. Right? Every person should be subject to the governing authorities. For, listen to this. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. That's right. That means Richard Nixon was allowed to be there by God. Gerald Ford was allowed to be there by God. Jimmy Carter was allowed to be there by God. Ronald Reagan, we go on, right? George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and now President Trump. They're instituted and allowed to be there by God. So let every person be subject to them. Now, we must obey God rather than man. That's another topic, another story. So, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. So, and then what the Bible also says, we should pray for those that are authority over us. So, first of all, God is over all the nations of the earth. And we are, the kingdom of God is first. Not the systems of the earth. You know what the Bible says here? It says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. We can't trust man without God. I can't trust myself without God. The Bible says, you know, my ways are higher than your ways. And the heart is deceitful and wicked. Who could know it? You see, I can't trust in man. And man, a lot of us are leaving and we're saying, okay, God, we're going to follow these parties instead. No, cursed is the man. I don't want to be cursed, do you? And cursed simply means not experiencing God's blessing. You go, you go against God's systems, you're going to experience difficulties ultimately. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns from the Lord. It says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here it says and also about our identity, for those of us have given our lives to Jesus Christ. By the way, I hate titles. I don't want to be called an evangelical anymore. Because evangelical means voting block. There are evangelicals for Biden. There are evangelicals for Trump. And all this, you know, and, well, the evangelicals. I am not an evangelical. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. And there's no way to heaven except through him. And the Bible is the word of God, period. And so I don't, I don't want, I hate these titles because if people can put you in a box, they can judge you and label you. I refuse to do that. Jesus refused to do that. Jesus was not religious at all. But the Bible says we are a chosen race. I'm not a white Christian. I'm a Christian that's white. Sandra's not a Colombian Christian. She's a Christian that comes from a Colombia background. Is that clear? That's God first, right? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Our job is to be a priest on this earth, a holy nation, a people, it says in the King James Version, a peculiar people. So if you think we're peculiar, that's the reason why. Okay. A, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. We will never change the world by becoming like the world. We will change the world by becoming like Jesus. Hands down, everybody. And, um, you know, I get a little concerned where people are identifying so much with these political parties and they're saying, well, you got to be, if you don't vote for this person, I've heard people say this, if you don't vote for Trump, you're, you're not a Christian. And if you don't vote for Biden, you know, you don't care about people. And so you hear all these things. I didn't, Donald Trump didn't die for me. In fact, I can't let my kids watch what he says. He dropped the F-bomb the other day. Hello? Oh, pastor, now I've offended a bunch of people. Oh, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. Well, hold on, hold on. Well, Joe Biden believes in partial birth abortion. He believes in abortion to the time just before the baby comes out of the birth canal. You can abort. Okay? Well, he just used a swear word. No big deal. He's not killing people. Listen, ladies, everybody. Donald Trump is not my savior. Joseph Biden is not my favor, savior. 
Kamala Harris is not my savior. God is my savior. And we have to start looking at that way, everybody. Because what's happening is we, we, are, we are losing our credibility when we put a political party before Jesus. You lose your credibility when you put your likes and thoughts and opinions. Well, I think this, I think, who cares what you think? What does the word of God say? But the word of God says, listen, it's God first. You soil the kingdom of God. I'm a Christian first. I'm a child of God first. I'm of the kingdom of heaven first. And then I like that referee. Now I look into the game and I might vote a particular way, but it's not from the standpoint of being Republican or Democrat. It's being a child of God. And there's no way we can do that. We have to pull ourselves out. You lose legitimacy. Is that, I hope you understand. We lose credibility. All those guys. Oh, there's a Trump. No, I'm not a Trump person. I'm a child of God. Do I agree? Do I agree with what's going on where we have nine, nine justices on the Supreme Court? It's supposed to be separation of powers. Supposed to keep politics out of the Supreme Court. And now they're saying, and the Democrats are saying, we're going to pack the court. Once we get in there, we're going to put 15 justices so we can get, because that's a, that's a serious matter. And they've asked Joe Biden, what are you going to do? I'll tell you after the election. Now that's a concern, Right? It's also concerned the way the president acts, talking, treating people very poorly. Listen, both are not right the way they act. Well, how do we make a right decision? Well, we'll talk about that more next week, but I will not get political. What we need to do is lay aside the personalities and look at the facts. What does the word of God say? What's going on in the field? What's a foul? And we need to call fouls to all parties involved. Don't defend bad behavior. It's not that bad what he did. Yeah, it's bad what he did. Yeah, it's bad what they're doing. So I hope you can understand. It's very simple today. What we need to do, we need to be kingdom first. Who are you for, God? Are you for our adversaries or for you? are you for us? He told us, neither. I'm of the kingdom of heaven. And that's the way we're going to make a difference in this world, partially. Now, the Bible says, you are the salt of the earth, but a salt has lost its taste. How shall its saltiness be restored? You know, salt was very important in the ancient world. In fact, the word salary comes from the, the root word salt, salary. They would pay you salt. Is that important? That's how you preserve meats. That's how you would do a bunch of things like that, okay? Because salt was very, very important in antiquity. It's important today, too. I hate food without salt. Praise the Lord for salt. I feel assaulted without salt. That's a bad joke. okay. You are the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its taste. How shall its saltiness be restored? The problem is this. A lot of the church, we are salt, and we're not a salt shaker here in the church, but we should be affecting. Yes, the church should be involved with politics. It's our ob obligation to be involved with politics, not to be the polit political person in regards to its party saying, I'm a, I'm a, no, I'm a Christian, and I vote. Democrat, I'm a Christian and I vote Republican because of these reasons based on the Bible. That's how we should make those decisions. How can you do that? Oh, listen, that's not for today. And by the way, you can't correct someone until you connect with somebody. So rants on Facebook or social media, why, why, if someone's yelling at me, am I going to listen to them? No way, right? I, I want to connect. That's why I hate labels. Connect, listen. Go to Christ first. I'm a child of God first. That's more important. This country, whatever. It's, another president, four years, whatever. Compared to the eternity, it's nothing. We have to be God first. You're the salt of the earth. How, how shall its saltiness be restored if we lose our salty taste? If we start living like the world and we start taking, we start making excuses, well, it's okay to do that because we have a higher cause and we lower our stand, we lose our saltiness. If we lose our saltiness, we'll be trampled. Listen to this. Is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the people's feet. You know, in the antiquity and the time when Jesus uh, said these words, there was a temple steps, and sometimes it would get cold, and they'd have ice on the temple steps. And what they would do, they would use the worthless salt, because salt was a big commodity. But it was worthless salt, lost its salty flavor, lost its salty, uh, what it could do, lost its properties. They would take that salt, that junk salt, and they would throw it on the temple steps. It would help melt the ice, and it would be trampled under the feet. And I think a lot of the church is being trampled under the feet because they don't take us seriously because we're more Republican, and we're more Democrat, and we're more like the world than Jesus Christ. We've lost our saltiness. It's time to divorce ourselves 
from everything else. I am a Christ follower first. He is my Lord and he's my savior. Savior, excuse me. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill not to be hidden. Don't hide your light. I'm not saying, well, no, we can't get involved with politics. It's bad. We just got to preach the gospel. No, it's our, we have to be involved in politics. We have to instruct politics. We have to be pro our prophetic voice. I'm really excited about a new series we're going to do on Jonah. We're going to talk about how to deal with a broken world. And God doesn't call us just to lock our doors and just, be, and just be your Christian people and pray he comes back quickly. We're to occupy till he returns. We're to make a difference. We're to be salt and light. I like what Martin Luther King Jr. said this about the church. In 1967, he wrote this. The church must be reminded that it's not the master or the servant of the state. Not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state, and never its tool. When Constantine, the Roman emperor, said, conquer with this, what he did, he syncretized Christianity and Roman government together, and that's when it went off the rails. We should not be a tool of the state. And what happens is, the Republican candidates want to get your vote, so they'll put on, they'll put on Christian robes. And they'll put on Christian cologne. But under that Christian cologne, you don't want to be alone with that. With that. Okay, it's a mess. It smells. It's not, really pure. it's not really pure. Or the Democrats will put on Christian. Everyone talks about God. Oh, we pray to God. You know, and they'll put on these Christian clothes and these religious garbs. And we say, oh, they must be good. No, no, no. You will know them by their fruits. And we are first believers in Christ. And so we not, we're going to be played as a fool. And that's what happens through political parties. They'll play you as a fool. So the church does not, if the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it would become a relevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Ouch. I'm sick to death of the church following the world. Copying the world. Being like the world. We should be innovators, not copiators. No such thing, I know. God is over all the nations of the earth. We are kingdom of God first, everybody. And here's another one. We are to love God and each other. Why is that so important? Because Jesus gave us a new commandment. This is what he said, the 11th commandment. A new commandment I give you that you what? Love, agape, love without strings. Love one another just as I have loved you. And you were a wreck without me, and I loved you. You also ought to love one another. Hello? So why will we argue? Listen, it's okay to have debates about politics and what's going to happen. Let's do it privately among ourselves. Let's not do it open air on the Internet with other believers, really, in a, I mean, with other people outside the church looking at us. It's okay to have our debates in the family. But remember, we're family. You ever get in an argument with your family members? Yeah, but do you love your family members? I do, You're right? It's okay to disagree, but we have a higher, we're family guys, right? So new commandment I give to you, love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciple if you have love for one another. We're not showing love to each other and respect for each other. Why would the world, they're just like, the, they're just like MSNBC, they're just like Fox News. They're, all they do is argue on each other. I don't want to be part of that. Rather, the Bible says, speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who's the head, and that is Christ. I appeal to you, as the apostle says someplace else. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would all agree that there be no divisions, do we see divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment, which is of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you today, this is what God would have us to begin to do as we conclude our time here today. So I just want to summarize again. Remember, everybody, that we are the kingdom of God first. We're not of a political party first. And we live by the kingdom of God first. God owns it all. All the, all the people you see out there, all the governments are placed there by God. God allows it. And we are to love each other and we are to be salt and light. 
And so, yes, it's important how we vote. We want to get involved with the school boards. We want to get involved with our local towns. We should. But God always has to be first. And his standard is higher than any human standard. I'm going to ask us to pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, as we're in the middle of this political season. Father, we recognize we are at a critical time in our nation. There's no question about it. But compared to you, it's minor. Father, we, we ask you to forgive us for allowing a political party to take our identity more than being a child of you. Father, we are your children. We are, we are your church. And Lord, we pray that we would be devoted to you 100%. Father, we would have the courage to speak to the political parties what's right and what's wrong. We would not make excuses for sin and, and negate what if our party is doing something wrong, we'll say it, the party that we vote into, that we would not lose our credibility, we would not lose our saltiness and be trampled by the feet of men, but we'd be salty. We would declare prophetically what's right and what's wrong in love and grace. Father, let us be people of integrity, of power in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray for mercy upon our country. Lord, we pray the trickery of men would be exposed and that there would be a clear choice and that your will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, let me ask you a question today. I ask you this every week. It's important. How are you with God? Remember, you can't save yourself. We mentioned this last week. I'll mention it again. I think it's really good. If you're on the top of a building and... You know, and, and the firemen are below you saying, jump, you're going to die. If you jump off, that takes faith. Grace is the net that catches you. You are saved by grace through faith. Have you jumped off being in control of your life? And have you given your life completely into Jesus? Completely. No, not, I'm talking throwing yourself onto Jesus. If you haven't done that, you're not saved. If he doesn't have it all, he has nothing. If you'd like to give your life to Christ, because my friend, there comes a day of judgment one day. You're going to have to stand before God to give an account of your life. And the truth is, I don't have it together, and neither do you. You don't have it what it takes to make it into heaven, and neither do I. And that's the great, that's the great news. The great news is that Jesus does, and he did it for us. And all he's asking us to do is agree with him and surrender our lives. And we can be with God. Because God's ways are higher, they're better, they're greater. He loves you. He wants great things for your life beyond what you can even hope or imagine. And it's not the American dream. God help us if it's that. It's so much higher than that. It's God's purposes. So I want to ask you to bow your heads. If you never given your life to Jesus, I want to pray with prayer with you right now. If you'll pray this prayer in faith, then today you can begin your journey of being a child of God, a Christian, a real Christian, not a Christian as the world says. So I'm going to repeat after me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to turn away from what I know is wrong. Also, today, I step down from being in charge of my life. This is not my life anymore. Lord, this is your life. Take it. It is yours. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. And give me the power to walk the path you have for me. Help me get connected to your body that I may grow. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, there's a connection card in front of your seat. If you're here in the building, if you're home, uh, you can text or text here, by the way. If you, like, if you gave your life to Christ for the first time, you can put BEGIN, uh, text BEGIN to 94090, and that will get you connected. Begin to 94090. We want to encourage you. We want to encourage you to get connected. There's a fresh start, a small group. We want to encourage you to get involved with. Get connected. That's how we grow together. It helps us grow. We want to encourage you with that. As we're doing that, everybody, I also want to give you an opportunity as we worship God through our giving. I'm telling you right now, just like the widow that was in a famine, she gave to God first and God provided for her. I'm going to tell you right now, if you'll trust God with what he's given you and you'll give, God will take care of you. I guarantee you. His word is true. I stand on his word. And so I encourage you to continue to tithe and to give. 
So Father, I pray you bless these tithes and offerings today in Jesus' name. I pray that you meet every single need that everyone has in this place as we trust you and realize that all things come from you. You're our provider. And we give back to what's yours anyhow in Jesus' name. There's different ways you can give. You can give uh, text Cornerstone Cheshire 77977. You can push pay app. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. You can snail mail or you can put them in the boxes. And let me just give you a, a quick illustration. I like waffle fries. I'm not going to say where from. <laughs> I'm not going to mention Chick-fil-A, okay? I promise you. <laughs> but but uh, if my son Matthew gets a, he, Dad, can I have waffle fries? And I give him, I buy waffle fries, right? I'm driving the, can I have one? No, they're mine. Now, why am I going to buy him an Oreo shake if he won't even give me a waffle fry, right? You know, listen, guys, listen God's our Father. He gives us stuff. Give it back to Him. Trust Him. He's a good Father. And I, I, I'm telling you right now, we, I'm saying it not because of Cornerstone. I'm saying it because it will bless you. Some of you are not tithing. That's 10%. Trusting God. The Bible says in Malachi 3, you're not giving to the Lord. You need to. The Bible says bring the tithe into the storehouse. I have no apologies about it because I know it works. It's God's. And, and if it's God's, guess whose problem it is? God's. There's two things that we have to do. Manage it, spend less than you make, and give. You do those two things, watch what God will do. Listen, thank you so much for taking the time today to uh, spend this time with us. Let's go after God. Let's choose to do His way. Let me just say a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine His light upon you and give you peace. Now go in His name. And let's be the people that God has called us to be. Amen, everybody? God bless you.